Well, we have said very clearly that, firstly, uh, the climate is changing, and uh, it's very likely that over the last five decades or so, the changes that have taken place are the result of human actions. And when we say very likely, it means more than 90% probability. So therefore, you can conclude that uh, we have clearly stated that climate change is taking place, and now it is largely the result of human actions, whatever may have been the case in past history. So we have to do something to control uh, the way human beings are emitting greenhouse gases. Otherwise, uh, in the 21st century, the changes will be much worse than what we saw in, in the 20th century. Well, actually, we have said right from the beginning, from the very first report, uh, that uh, it is uh, likely that human beings uh, are responsible for climate change. But the evidence has now become much stronger. So now we can say it with much greater certainty. And that's why we use the term very likely, because that means a 90% probability. I think the evidence has now become much stronger. Our knowledge about climate change is also much better. You know, uh, we have uh, looked at a range of scenarios of the future uh, when it comes to emissions of greenhouse gases. And this, of course, depends on changes in the economy, changes in demography, population, technology, and so on. And based on these scenarios, we have come up with projections for the 21st century, which indicate that at the upper end, we could get a temperature increase by the end of this century of 6.4 degrees Celsius, and at the lower end, about 1.1 degrees Celsius. Now, in order to come up with somewhat clearer projections, uh, we have come up with the best estimate at the lower end of 1.8 degrees Celsius and at the upper end of 4 degrees Celsius. Now, even at the lower end, 1.8 degrees is a very high increase in temperature. And I would say that uh, today the Earth is moving in a manner that, or human society is moving in a manner that we are probably going towards the upper end. And therefore, we have to be very careful about uh, limiting our emissions of greenhouse gases in the future. Carbon dioxide is the cause behind climate change. And therefore, those activities which are emitting carbon dioxide are obviously imposing a cost on the Earth, on humanity, on this generation and the next generation. So somehow, we have to indicate that there's a higher price on carbon than what people are paying in buying fossil fuels or whatever else uh, is related to carbon uh, dioxide emissions. And therefore, if we were to place a price on carbon, then this will be a very useful signal for the market to develop non-carbon products or low-carbon products. And that's why if we want to move to a low-carbon future, it's essential to see that we provide this price on carbon which will lead to development of low-carbon technologies and products and processes. So that's why it's critically important as a policy tool to see that we place a price on carbon. And we have said that very clearly in the fourth assessment report of the IPCC. Well, you know, uh, Kyoto was a starting point. It was a useful experience. And in several respects, it has not succeeded. Uh, one major reason why it didn't succeed is because the USA and Australia didn't even ratify the Kyoto Protocol. Of course, Australia has come back to uh, ratifying it uh, much later. But that, I think, was a major problem that, of course, we don't foresee as far as Copenhagen is concerned, because we have a new president in the US who is uh, very, very focused, President Obama, on uh, as he says, uh, having the U.S. to lead in this business of uh, protecting the Earth's climate. Australia has had a major political change. So I think the conditions are very different. But what we can learn from uh, Kyoto is essentially the fact that merely governments agreeing on certain targets is not enough. You have to somehow carry the population of each country, you've got to carry the industry in each country, so that they are able to implement the targets that government set. Now, this time around, may I say that um, you find the public 
uh, generally much more focused on this issue. And even parts of industry and business are much more proactive about taking steps. So I don't anticipate that in Copenhagen we'll have the same problems that we had with Kyoto. In the case of Kyoto, if you look at the United States, they were just not able to get uh, the Kyoto Protocol through the Senate. And of course, after that, there was a change in government and George W. Bush didn't even want to submit uh, the protocol for ratification by the Senate. So, you know, I think the political conditions are very different this time. However, we should uh, also learn from the Kyoto Protocol by making sure that we have some means by which we verify and we create some incentives and disincentives for the countries uh, that are going to be involved in this new agreement. Well, I think the main obstacles are, in my view, uh, the fact that uh, industry in several countries will resist any kind of targets that governments agree on. And in the case of the US, there are some industries that are very powerful. These are basically the fossil fuel industries. And if you look at news reports, they have already started spending much more on their lobbyists in Washington and on advertising against taking action. So there are vested interests, and those clearly are going to be pretty difficult to handle. Although I would say that in a democracy, if public opinion is strong on any particular matter, then everybody will fall in line. And in the US this year, it seems that public opinion is strong at this point of time. So um, I would say that that's one major hurdle. And the other hurdle, of course, is unfortunately the fact that we have an economic crisis right now. So governments are now distracted. They're only thinking about reviving the economy. And somehow uh, climate change has gone on the back burner. But I expect that this will change in the next two or three months because once you see even some faint signs of economic recovery, then people are going to start looking at the more basic and fundamental problems with the economy. And when that happens, I'm sure climate change will get due attention. You know, the IPCC had actually done a special report on carbon capture and storage. And while we certainly see the potential for carbon capture and storage, uh, we feel that the technology is not quite ready to be commercialized on a large scale. And therefore, what we need is many more projects. We need a lot more research and development and demonstration projects. And once we have enough assurance that some of the risks associated with CCS and the costs that are going to be incurred look more attractive, then certainly carbon capture and storage would be of great value, particularly for coal-based power generation. Uh, but I would say, at the moment, the technology is not ready for large-scale application. Uh, it will, if enough effort and enough expenditure is incurred, uh, will become uh, an attractive technology. But there is a lot of work that has to be done so far. No, I think the, the, it, there is now great evidence that the oceans are certainly getting saturated. And to be quite honest, we don't have enough knowledge about what the capacity of the oceans is. But there's every reason to believe, based on evidence that's available, that it is pretty close to saturation. So we cannot expect carbon dioxide to be absorbed in any large quantity by the oceans any further. And when it comes to uh, land areas, then the one thing that could help is large-scale afforestation. Uh, and certainly, to arrest the problem that we have currently, we have to stop deforestation. So avoided deforestation would be an important tool. But more importantly, I think if we can grow biomass on a much larger scale, then that will certainly capture a large quantity of carbon. So there is potential over there. There's no doubt about it. I'm not too sure whether we can expect the oceans to absorb any further carbon dioxide. That's not likely to happen. Well, my belief is that you really don't have, as they say, a silver bullet. There is no single solution. I think we have to do a large range of things. And I should also emphasize that it's not just technology that we have to change. We also have to change our lifestyles. People don't want to hear that. 
because they feel that, you know, all the comforts that they've been accustomed to will be taken away from them. From them. But that's not necessary. You know, if you build an energy efficient home, then that doesn't mean you have to freeze inside your home. That just means that you are spending a lot of time and care and perhaps a little more money in building a new home. And by that, you would consume much less energy to give you the same comfort. So I think what we really need is changes by which we uh, invest in new technologies. But we also have to ensure that we bring about changes in lifestyles. For instance, if somebody wants to keep uh, his or her thermostat at uh, 28 or 29 degrees during the winter, well, perhaps you have to bring it down to 24, 25 degrees and wear a cardigan if you feel cold. So those are the kinds of lifestyle changes that are going to be essential. Or instead of driving a Hummer or an SUV, you drive a small energy efficient car. I mean, that's not giving up anything at all except something that's part of your ego. So I think those adjustments human society will have to make. And if we do all those things, then there's no reason why we can't cut down on our emissions. It's a huge opportunity. And I think we have to understand it as such because let's face it, over the last many decades, the pattern of development that we have adopted is not sustainable. We cannot continue on the same path because if we do, it's going to damage the ecosystems of this planet, it's going to use up all the resources that we have taken for granted. We will also have serious problems of rich and poor because there are some things that the rich can afford and the poor will not be able to afford them. So we have to come up with a new pattern of development, a totally new paradigm. And I think it's a huge opportunity and people must realize that. Uh, in some sense, it's a blessing that it has come today. If it hadn't, then perhaps we would have continued and maybe created a much bigger crisis in the future. So I regard it as a positive blessing and an opportunity. I mean, I have a deep mental conviction that we need to bring about change. And the reason why we need to bring about change is because otherwise, whatever human, the human race has worked hard for will be lost and things will get much worse over a period of time. So I'm doing it out of a passion. I feel emotional about the fact that what we've been doing so far is largely wrong. And I'm not saying that we have to go back to the days when we were living in caves. But we have to correct the mistakes that we have been making for much too long. So I'm doing it out of a certain passion, a certain, certain intellectual conviction. And yes, I am concerned about future generations, but I'm also concerned about this generation because some of the problems of climate change will hit us even in this generation. And I think it would be, fo it would be foolish to ignore it. You know, I believe that uh, perhaps this is a problem that cannot be sorted out by governments alone. And I'm firmly of the view, and I have actually increased my belief in this view, uh, that it has to be people power that is going to make a difference. So people, every single individual has to be convinced that action is required in this area. And if they start showing their preference for what needs to be done, then politicians won't have a choice. Because you have to give credit to politicians. They know what the people want. And they certainly know what the people don't want. So therefore, I, I believe that uh, it is absolutely essential for the people to assert themselves, to show their strength, and perhaps start taking some action themselves. I mean, just to give you an example, I would like to see a large-scale boycott of those products which are very high in carbon intensity and are supplied by companies who are not prepared to move. I think if people did that directly, that would send a very powerful message and companies will change. And governments will also realize that people want something which they have been neglecting all this while. So I really think the time has come for much greater people power to express itself. And if that happens, then governments, companies and decision makers in general will start moving in the right direction.